Welcome back. I'm Barry Craig. There's a new monument in town, and an old street has a new name, and my guest today played a major role in bringing that about. She is historic preservationist Betty Dobson. Welcome back to the program. Well, thank you for having me. The monument is to Clarence Big House Gaines, and 7th Street is now Clarence Gaines Street. Now, you and I know who Clarence Gaines was. Basketball fans should know who Clarence Gaines was, but tell the viewers who was Clarence Big House Gaines. Well, Clarence Big House Gaines was the son of Olivia and Lester Gaines of Paducah, Kentucky. So he is a Paducah native that went on and did well. Um, coach, and I call him Coach because that is his name to uh, hundreds of his students and friends and family members. Um, always kept ties to Paducah. And as you said, uh, uh, if you knew basketball, you should know about Coach. He was, when I met him in 2000, he was the third winningest collegiate basketball coach in America. I think he was right under Adolph Ruff, and he was upset about it. He wanted to be number one, of course. <laughs> but he, he was a um, wonderful man who was bigger than, than life. Uh, he lived up to his name, Big House. <laughs> He coached at Winston-Salem College in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I guess it's Winston-Salem University now mm -hmm. in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Historically African-American school. He grew up in Paducah during the Jim Crow era when segregation and race discrimination were the law and the social order. And his parents ran the Metropolitan Hotel, which you played the major role in preserving literally from the wrecking ball. Tell us about the Metropolitan Hotel and maybe some of its better known guests. Okay. Well, uh, Mr. Gaines and his wife, uh, I think her name is Claire, uh, if I remember correctly, I always called her Mrs. Gaines, mm -hmm. helped uh, Mr. Gaines' uh, parents, Olivia and Lester, to purchase the Hotel Metropolitan. Mm -hmm. And before they purchased the Hotel Metropolitan, it was um, a uh, stopping place on the Chitlin circuit for all types of uh, sports figures, religious uh, people, political folks, uh, uh, musicians, you mm -hmm. name it, uh, because it was the era of Jim Crow. Uh, if you were a uh, artist worth any salt, you would travel the Chitlin circuit in the Hotel Metropolitan had a great name on the Chitlin per, uh, circuit as a place to stay. Mm -hmm. And of course, by coach, uh, mother and father owning the hotel, he would tell his friends. So folks like the Harlem Globetrotters would stop by. Marcus Haynes mm -hmm. uh, told me stories about how not Mrs. Gaines, but the previous owner who was um, uh, Mamie Geish would get them up at six o'clock in the morning and have biscuits and coffee. He said it didn't matter how hungover you were, what went on the night before, you had to have your butt at that table at six o'clock to have your, uh, you know, biscuits and coffee. It was, right. you know, part of your, your stay. And not only that, the Negro League baseball players uh, stayed there. We know Satchel Paige stayed at the hotel, mm -hmm. uh, Josh Gibson, mm -hmm. Um, Jesse Owens, because Jesse would travel with the Harlem Globetrotters. He was an attraction. So he stayed there in 1942 because uh, Mr. Haynes, Marcus Haynes, shared that with us. Uh, Coach Gaines told us about Butterbean and Susie, who, who was a comedic couple who raised Mom Mabley. Now, some of these folks, you know. Oh, Mom I know Mabley. Mom's Mabley, absolutely, <laughs> yes. She was hilarious. Yeah. Yes, yeah. but yeah. Uh, uh, Butterbean and Susie pretty much adopted her and brought her up in the ways of comedy. And so if we didn't have Mom Mabley, we wouldn't have had Red Fox or Richard Pryor, yeah. Eddie Murphy, right. Right. <laughs> uh, Kevin Hart, who we enjoy today. Yeah. They yeah. all came yeah. from these folks. Now, didn't Louis Armstrong also stay Louis there? Louis Armstrong stayed there. Let's see who else. Um, I told you about Thurgood Marshall. Right. Uh, 
Ike and Tina Turner exactly. stayed there. Yeah. Did B.B. King stay there? B.B. King stayed there. I was thinking that was right because I believe, if I, if memory serves me, that uh, Gladman Humbles was a good friend of ours. Uh, he told me that before B.B. King would come to town, he would phone ahead and I believe get Robert Coleman's mother to make him sweet potato pies. That's right. In uh, fact, there was a story, uh, and, and it, and I know, you know, our history, African-American history, a lot of it is oral history. Right. And uh, several folks came up to me and said that they recall if they didn't do it, their parents uh, coming to the Hotel Metropolitan, seeing B.B. on the front porch, eating on some sweet potato pie. And most of them told me that Mr. Coleman's mother made that pie, you know, uh, uh, Commissioner Coleman didn't brag about that much, mm -hmm. but other people around talked about how B.B. loved this pie and would uh, let her know when he was coming in town so she could have it ready for him. Yeah. And uh, when he, he was gambling uh, one particular time that he was here, lost all of his money, had to stay here for a few days, and he was set out on the porch of the hotel playing his uh, Lucille, and people would throw money up on the porch. And so that's how he what gained a enough funding story. to yeah. leave. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And of course, again, the, the monument is in Robert Coleman Park. Yes. Um, uh -huh. Now, getting back to Coach Gaines, he grew up in Paducah, mm -hmm. played uh, football at, at Lincoln uh, High School, mm -hmm. got a scholarship to Morgan State, again, historically African-American school in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And what I found funny, uh, interesting, was... Um, in an interview it was in 2004, which was a year before he died, he said, and I quote, I was a very average basketball player who was just on the basketball team to have something to do. Now, he was all conference in football and all American in football. And of course, his nickname, according to what I read, and you can confirm this, was a student said, that guy's as big as a house. Now, I, I was looked up some statistics. Uh, he was about six feet four and weighted between 250 and 265. He was obviously a lineman. But I thought that was fascinating. Here this guy goes on to become this immortal Hall of Fame basketball coach. He's in the Naismith Hall of Fame, as is Earl of Pearl Monroe. Mm -hmm. But yet he was an average, he says I was just an average player, that football was his forte. I thought that was interesting. Did you ever talk about that? Uh, not really. Uh, I'm not really a sports enthusiast, but I, I listened. <laughs> and um, I would say this about Coach. He had very high standards. So he was probably a great uh, athlete in, in basketball and just hard on himself because maybe he didn't reach his particular standards mm -hmm. of excellence. But I'm sure he was great at whatever he did because he was a um, tall man uh, and uh, great stature. He kept in shape um, basically till the end of his life. He lived to be, lived to be 81. Mm -hmm. uh, well, when he was back home visiting, did he talk about growing from Paducah, about going to school here and Look, much? When people would come in like... Um, you know, I've reached out to a lot of celebrities uh, over the years, and I remember Marcus Haynes coming here, and he looked around, and he said, Betty, I'm, I'm really ashamed of you all. And I said, why? And he said, because Big House, and most people called him Big House, mm -hmm. Big House loved Paducah. All he talked about was what Paducah was, what a good time, good place to raise your kids Paducah was. And, and here I look about and I don't see a monument or anything mm -hmm. in his honor. And uh, so I commend J.W. Cleary. I know a lot of people think that I had a great deal to do with that. That's not true. It was J.W. Cleary the NAACP group that just thought, you know, it was time, although I supported it. And, and I'm so proud of him mm -hmm. getting that accomplished, uh, that we have something here for him now. And uh, we intend to, because we are a quilt city, we're intending to also have a quilt made oh, in that his would, honor. Yeah, that would be good. Uh -huh. Dr. Nancy Dawson will be taking on, undertaking that task. and. She said that she would be working with local students to give input on um, 
not just to make the quilt, but to inform them of their history. You know, a lot of kids nowadays, they have role models to look up to, but not someone that brought something to the table like Coach, Coach Gaines. Uh, Coach loved Paducah, and when he was, uh, you know, when he, before he retired, he made sure if he came back to Paducah and you had potential, then he, he was going to help you. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the, the, the monument unveiling and the street naming were in connection with the 8th of August celebration recently held. Mm -hmm. And you brought some uh, pretty famous people to town for that, including one fellow who I believe is near and dear to the heart of University of Kentucky basketball fans, and that would be Tubby Smith. Oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, so uh, what did Tubby Smith have to say about Paducah? Well, he loved it. And um, I, I, I was getting ready to say it was him, but I believe it was one of the other speakers that came because Paducah was so gracious. Uh, the mayor and uh, the judge executive handed out um, Dukes of uh, Paducah Oh, my Wars. goodness, yes. And so um, one of the gentlemen, uh, one of Coach's um, protégés said, this is the first time I ever came to uh, an unveiling, and I received an award. So well, that's nice. That's <laughs> you nice. You know, they really love Paducah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they knew Coach loved Paducah yeah, as well. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, uh, astonishing record uh, winning uh, I I of winning in 828 games mm -hmm. at Winston Salem State University, now West State College, um, and the the some of the f folks that hit them, Dean Smith, University of North Carolina, Adolph Rupp, Kentucky, and of course Bobby Knight at uh, uh, Indiana a as well. Uh, they won the Division II National Championship in 1967 when I graduated from high school, a long time ago, mm -hmm. and that was Earl Monroe. He mm -hmm. was their, their, their guard. Have you met him? You said oh, yes. you have. Mm -hmm. uh, he was very colorful as a player, very flamboyant, uh, and that's why he was called the Pearl. Mm -hmm. what, what is he like? He's a, a wonderful man. Um, he's uh, when he got off the plane, uh, you know, I went to Nashville to pick him up, and as soon as he got off the plane, he, you could tell it was him. And uh, he now uses a cane. Uh, all those uh, signature moves that mm -hmm. he used to do had mm -hmm. taken a toll oh, on yeah. his back over the years, but um, he's still a statuous uh, gentleman mm -hmm. and just as nice as he could be. And he traveled with... Uh, Eddie Brown, which is also one of Coach's uh, students, and all during my time when we would go to lunch or whatever, they had something to say about Coach in every other breath. If it wasn't th the one, uh, Mr. Brown, then it was Earl. But uh, they love Coach. Uh, he made such an influence on them. And if Earl hadn't had to have surgery soon, I believe he would have been here. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, event. for a teacher or a coach, that is so gratifying when students or former players come up to you and say, I remember you. You were a great influence on my life mm -hmm. and, and things like that. That really, that really makes it worthwhile. Um, what's going on with the Metropolitan as we speak? I know it's on the National Register of Historic Places, and it's been renovated. And uh, so tell us about we talked about this. How many years ago was that when you started that drive to save the Metropolitan? 17 years ago. 17 years ago, but who's counting, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it literally, it literally was, was going to be torn down. And I remember when I worked for the newspaper here back when I was thin and had hair, that was a long time ago, <laughs> going over there and, and writing a story about it. And there was a sign. You, you were able to preserve the sign, the Metropolitan Hotel sign out front. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit about the renovation. I mean, what is it? What, is it completely renovated now? Or it's what? completely renovated. And um, we open um, once a month uh, during the summer, uh, each first Friday. We have uh, a fish fry for the public, and uh, our plates are about $9. It just depends on what mm -hmm. we're having. And we serve up slaw, all the fixings. Uh, uh, my mother called it green tomato ketchup. Some people call it chow chow. That's right. And yep. uh, we serve that up along with cornbread, chest pie, 
uh, or cake, you know, whatever, you know, sometimes we throw in a little greens. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> Wonderful. But it's a means of uh, keeping the mm -hmm. hotel going. I, I tell folks it's uh, something I think that we got from uh, uh well, I got it from my mother, but when you think about it, it's something that uh, a lot of black women did over the years. You know, had, had you ever heard of the pie lady? Mm -hmm. And, um, she, you know, she supported the civil rights movement and she did it by selling her pies. Right. So that's the way we're keeping the hotel right. going right. by selling right. those plates. You right. know, it pays for a uh, light bill or gas bill. Well, when you did the research on the Metropolitan, did you come across any records? For example, it was a boarding house. Mm -hmm. It was room and board. Mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, what were the room rates? Of course, I know that would have increased as time went on, but say when, when uh, Big House Gaines was, was in, in, in that era, what would it have cost? Do you know? No, I really don't. But now during ba Maggie's time, the original owner, uh, I, I didn't find anything in her information, but what I did find across the nation for those that were called colored hotels, right. the rate was $2.50 a day. Well, and that would include breakfast? A breakfast. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it was like a bed and breakfast like a B &B. before B&Bs came mm -hmm. along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. How many rooms does it have? We have, um, well, there's nine rooms upstairs. And uh, Maggie was doing so well with her business, she was intending to put on a third floor, but she passed away before she was able to do so. Uh, and then there were two rooms downstairs that was uh, used to, as, uh, you know, for boarding. So there were, there were a total of 11 rooms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When you restored it, and Big House Gaines came back. What, what was his impression to see it? He obviously was thrilled, but did he, what did he say about it? Well, unfortunately, we didn't have it completed before Mr. Gaines died, but what we were able to do is that we knew that people in general, myself included, if you don't see any results, then why should I help you? So what we decided to do is that we did a room at a time. We did the foyer and we did the living room area and then we moved on to the dining room. So we got two rooms uh, completed that Coach could see, mm -hmm. but he told us, uh, he met, he called us three little girls. That was myself, uh, Cheryl uh, Cooper, and a lady named Sharon Pote, and he called us three little girls. He kept saying, I don't know if you three little girls can handle this, but our la the last time he had came to Paducah and he took us to lunch and he said, you know what? I think the hotel's in pretty good hands. I think you'll, you'll do okay, you little girls. <laughs> <laughs> In doing the research, I mean, what records were you able to find? Uh, not, not, for example, I don't, were you able to find a guest register? Coach lost it. He uh, grabbed up the register. Well, let me, let me say this. His, uh, after his parents passed away, his aunt ran the hotel for a number of years. And I believe she died in 95 and someone else tried to run the hotel uh, and it closed in 96 and it was condemned in 99. Mm -hmm. So he came back home, collected some of those items he felt were collectible and he wanted to keep, uh, put that on top of his car along with a cup of coffee. He said, uh, reach for his coffee as he took off, you know, and realized he had that, those items on top of the car and didn't know where he lost them. He said, I was way up the road before I, you know, realized that. That's actually pretty easy to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, 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 oh, what a tremendous autograph collection that guest book would have been. Um, were you able to find anything like bills or, or advertising for it or? And you know, I did and, and I, I left that. I wanted to share that with you. And it was really kind of odd how I found it this morning. I was getting my earrings out and looking for pictures and things like that to show you. And I 
thought, here's a pack of matches. <laughs> where, where did matches come from? And I looked at it, and it said the Metropolitan House owners, wow. Olivia, Mr. and Mrs. Lester Gaines, 724 that's, Jackson Street, that's Duke, great. Kentucky. Any of the furniture, is, is it original, any of the furniture in there? Almost all of it. <laughs> wow. So how was that preserved? Just, was it just in the building? It was in the building and in the outbuildings. In fact, uh, the hotel as you enter has beautiful uh, lattice work mm -hmm. in the uh, grills. Well, that was covered with brown paneling and one of the grills was found out in the building, uh, one of our outbuildings. And we have chairs that we brought in, beds that uh, were out in those buildings. We brought in dressers and uh, mm -hmm. it just gives a, you know, a kind of a, um, I don't know, uh, uh, that throwback yeah, kind oh, of yeah, look. It, it's, so it, you had restored to about what period, 1940s, 50s or? Well, we go, we run the gamut from the um, 19, the hotel was built in 1908. From that period, you might experience uh, all the way up to, in, in fact, we have a Civil War exhibit. So we even go uh, prior to the, uh, you know, the early mm -hmm. 1900s. So you could, there's something for everybody at the mm -hmm. hotel. There's, mm -hmm. it, you know, if it's dealing with African American history, you're going to find something. Mm -hmm. about it in the uh, hotel. Uh, for folks who don't know where it is, what is the address? It's 724 Oscar Cross Avenue. Now, uh, sometimes if you're using uh, MapQuest or, or GPS or something like that, you might have to enter Jackson Street. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the original name of the street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, Oscar Cross, I had him on the show some time ago talking about the 1937 flood. He lived through that. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I, what happened to the hotel during the flood? Do you know? Well, that's interesting. One day, this gentleman named Jamie, I can't remember his last name. I want to say Fox, but I think that's, the, uh, that's not his name. But he works with the radio station. Mm -hmm. And he said, Betty, do you have any of the pictures uh, during the flood where uh, Mr. Lackey uh, was broadcasting from the hotel. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Wow. He said the owner during the 37th flood, which would have been Miss Geesh, um, allowed Mr. Lackey, who ran a radio station. He was Pierce Lackey, Pierce, I think, yeah. right, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. To was he Mayor broadcast. Paducah, maybe? At one point, I believe I he, was, he was, but yeah. at that particular time, um, he was um, the radio announce mm -hmm. announcer mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. I didn't either. So, uh, uh, well, where that hotel was, that would have been several feet of water. Uh, I used to tell my students about the 37 flood, and of course, they were just, just agog at, at mm -hmm. you think about you go out Jefferson Street to that monument beyond 28th Street with the Spread Eagle, that's how far the water went. Mm. And I've read that the river was seven miles across in Paducah because in Illinois, as you know, it's flat all the way to Shawnee Hills. Uh, but if you go downtown and take a look at the flood wall and bring your eyes down about three feet, that's how deep it was, about mm -hmm. 10 feet deep down there. And of course, Paducah being flat where the Metropolitan was, it would have been probably eight feet there. Um, and, and it all made sense to us afterwards because uh, we had a wallpaper conservator to come in and he was saying there's, you know, we've got like a dozen, two dozen uh, layers of wallpaper oh, yeah. here and downstairs there's barely uh, three or four layers. Wonder, wonder what happened mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. It was ruining the flood. It was the flood. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, some of the buildings, there's a shoe store downtown called the Ground Floor, and if you go in on the wall, they've got a plaque that says High Water Mark 1937 Flood, which of course was way above. But those are fascinating stories about, mm -hmm. about the flood. When I worked for the newspaper here many years ago, in 1987, we did a 50th anniversary edition of the flood. And again, Oscar Cross talked about that, uh, W.C. Young and people 
lots of people who, who live through it. It, 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 it. It's amazing. And that is all such, that's all part of Paducah history. So mm -hmm. anyway, um, again, getting back to Coach Gaines, who graduated from Paducah Lincoln, played uh, football at Morgan State from 41 to 45 during World War II there and uh, was, was part of a conference called the Colored Intercollegiate Athletic Association. It's now the Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association. And this is schools, traditionally African-American schools in and around the Washington area. And uh, uh, I'm a big Cleveland Browns football fan, which if you're a football fan, you know that's quite a cross to bear. The Browns have won a championship <laughs> since 1964. Uh, but one of the Cleveland Browns' greatest running backs was Leroy Kelly, who played at, at Morgan State after Coach Gaines considerably, but mm -hmm. uh, there's a Morgan State uh, connection there. So uh, uh, talk about the future of the Metropolitan. What do you hope for the future? Uh, is, it, is it pretty well the way you want it, or do you want to do more? Oh, well, there's always work. It's a 100-plus-year-old building, oh, yeah. so there's always work. And it's wooden, work. too, which and makes it wooden. more <laughs> difficult. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, uh, but we have been blessed in many ways. Uh, as you were saying, it's wooden, and one, uh, when we had that really bad rain at one point, uh, the old siding had a hole to come into the exterior wall. Rain was coming in, mm. and it had uh, made one of our walls collapse, and it was like $5,000 to repair. It was a little hole, but it did a lot of, oh, yeah. you know, damage, and so... Uh, we were blessed that uh, Ray Black and Son uh, took pity on us and helped us out with uh, the repair of the building. And then we're always uh, working towards the Purple Room. The Purple Room, um, uh, although, because we couldn't really prove its historical significance, we couldn't get a lot of uh, um, support or grant funding mm -hmm. to repair the outer buildings and but the purple room was where uh, folks would perform a lot of the big name entertainers right. would go out there mm -hmm. they couldn't play inside the hotel so they constructed mm -hmm. the, the what they call mm -hmm. the purple room for mm -hmm. them to perform in mm -hmm. and um, uh, uh, Lisa uh, McDowell, who was uh, Coach's uh, daughter, shared with us how um, that building was used for uh, not only uh, tinkering her grandfather to fix things, but it was an activity room mm -hmm. and uh, that she knew of. We're out of time. Okay. I knew we'd run out. We'll have to come back and do this again. Okay. My guest today was Betty Dobson, historical preservationist, and we're talking about Clarence Big House Gaines who has a new monument and a street name for him in Paducah. I'm Barry Craig. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.